supposed to blink slowly and it's not blinking slowly but uh, let's assume it's okay it's difficult for me to see what's happening so uh, right so we are basically diving into the end of the course we already reached almost first of November so we do have only a limited number of lectures left so but I, th I think we, we're going to finish in uh, some style uh, covering the remaining um, basically five, six, seven chapter in the compendium. We will finish number four today and then we'll be, we have some shorter chapters in the end here. And the topic of course is now going to be regression analysis for all our money and we're going to start today just discussing a little bit more on the basic two variable model and then in the end we will start up briefly talking about what is called the multiple uh, regression where we have several x variables which is going to be a little bit more exciting actually so we started with this model here last week um, it's a model for dependence between variables. So it's a linear dependence model. And it has these two parameters describing this linear function. And then there's an error term with this additional parameter sigma there, which is the standard deviation of this error term. Um, So we discussed uh, last week how we would look at a set of observations. So x i and y i together. And we have a set of observations like this. And using this least squares method, we would estimate what we call the best linear model for this. So we have a theoretical model like this and we have a, a concrete estimated line. So these would be some numbers, right? So this line would sit something like here. Okay. And sort of in science, uh, if we talk like that, there are two main purposes of using regression analysis. And the first one is we very often want to understand how different variables uh, relate, how x affects y and so on. And maybe not so much in science, but in uh, in business and governance and so on, we want to use this understanding to make forecasts and predictions. So we want to use the understanding of uh, some relations to forecast, for instance, demands based on other, other variables. So there are those two main sort of purposes for regression analysis. Yeah, so there's an interesting forecasting situation going on today, if you follow the news, just in the mountains in here. There's about 120,000 cubic meters coming down from a mountain, and they like to of course, no, approximately when does this happen? So they are now monitoring the data. This thing is moving and so on. It's moving like six, seven centimeters the past few hours. And they are saying maybe tonight between eight and nine is the best forecast now for when it's going to come down. And part of that number is probably used or depends on some regression analysis also based on previous observations of Mountains falling down. Right. What is going to happen during the 
Hmm? What is going to be happen? Here? I mean, there? <laughs> uh, now, it's, what's happening is just that you have this uh, Romstal, this valley, which is uh, where the Trollvägen uh, mountain is, close to that. And it's about 1,200 meters high. And now they observe this piece of the mountain is just moving. And usually when mountain pieces move, they go down, right? <laughs> So the most certain thing is it's going down, but um, and there are some people living here, uh, or they're not. They yeah. yeah, they were moved, of course. Yeah. I think maybe there was one guy who wouldn't leave, but uh, <laughs> probably they talked him into it. Uh. <laughs> Swedish, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> actually. Um. Right. Okay, so this is what we talked about last week, the <laughs> theoretical model with the parameters and the, the estimates from data. And we did a little bit of work last week. It maybe went a little bit fast, but we came through it anyway. And now we can say we repeat it. So we wanted to do what we call, what we call inference, which is basically, for instance, <coughs> Uh, having confidence intervals for those theoretical parameters. So for, especially for beta 1, which is the slope of not this line, but of the true theoretical line. This is an unknown <coughs> parameter. <coughs> but we like to use data to say as much as possible about this one. And the way to do that is either make a confidence interval or test some sort of interesting statement about this parameter. So the confidence intervals, they are of course centered at this estimate and then you have plus minus some error margin. And the error margin is related to standard deviation of the estimate, which we call SBI, plus some percentiles from the T distribution like this. Um, yeah. And we saw that we could convince SPSS to compute those confidence intervals for us, if we like to. And secondly, the standard test, which is often most relevant also for the beta 1 parameter, is just to test whether we can reject, in a way, the statement that this is zero. So recall again, what does it mean if this is zero? It means the line is beta 1 zero means the model says y equals beta zero plus nothing or plus an error, but the, the beta 1 times x term goes. So we don't have a regression model if beta 1 is 0. It's like this. So there's no significant dependency between x and y, at least not in the linear sense. So we always want to check this standard test. Um, the test statistic, it just takes this estimate and divides it by its own standard deviation. So it looks like this. And it has a t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom. So for reasonable sample sizes, the distribution of this guy is very close to a standard normal. I have two statistics courses, and I, frankly speaking, do not exactly remember how much I discussed t distributions in this course. <coughs> I think I did it more in the other course, but there you go. But um, we were discussing them a little bit, at least. But basically, when I say t distribution, and especially if n is greater than 30, t distribution. Yeah. 
I would say, OK, let's be roughly correct and say standard normal distribution. Right? So it's one of my um, pragmatic choices for this course not to be too detailed about the small sample statistics, because then we always have to go in and do the details for small samples. And I think if you need it for your master thesis, you can equally well just read it for yourself, which you would have to do anyway, because you will be by then have forgotten whatever I said in this course. So we, we try to stick to the big lines, understanding what is a test statistic, and using normally, for instance, this distribution. For OK. So I'm, I'm more or less just repeating from last week, but we, that's not a bad thing, I guess. This is the um, main SPSS coefficient output from our regression analysis. So the B0 and the B1, they are <coughs> coefficients. And the standard error that you see here, these are the what I called in the notation S B one and stuff. So these are the standard deviations. So if you take that coefficient divided by this one, you get the T statistic for this particular test. Um, of, and this is the distance and duration data, and the distance was the y. No, the duration was the y variable, and the distance of trips was the x variable. And of course, you reject this one in that case. So the t statistic was, I mean, 41. That's uh, tremendously large for a t statistic. So the p value is 0, and so on. We discussed this confidence interval from about 2.12 to 2.32, 2.33. Yeah, so this we discussed last week, and we'll review it in the exercises and so on. Uh, yeah. Maybe I can show you just while I remember it. Um, We had last year um, a very nice um, assistant teacher who was, whose name is Katrina Schatton. And she made, in another course, which she thought she made a very thorough discussion or presentation of the uh, regression output in SPSS, which is quite substantial. And so she made this thing. It's a small PDF. And it connects the um, SPSS output to what we discuss in the theory. So this is part of the SPSS output. And this is another part. And the third part is what I just showed you. And here she has made a great job in explaining all of these things. Um, and you can print this and bring to exam, for instance, actually. And so you see, for instance, remember I discussed the R square last week, which was the ratio of some square sums. So it's here. And then R square sits here. And where are the square sums? Well, they are here, discussed. And she does it for several pages. So it looks almost a little bit um, scary. But I think this could be of some assistance. And here is the final. Uh, main coefficient output. So you see slope coefficient, standard error or standard deviation of this estimate is this one. And this is the student t, the t distributed statistic. This is p-value for the standard test. These are confidence intervals with, with this formula and so on. So this thing is in fronter in additional material folder. And you can have it and do whatever you like with it. For instance, read it. Or look at it. 
Um, yeah. So it's also a bit helpful for me because I don't have to do that all of this for all of the output, which is quite extensive. Okay. So this one is slightly new regarding what I talked about last week. It's just an extension of the standard test. And now it's called the general test for coefficients. So consider for the for the slope parameter, sometimes we might want to test a different value than zero here. Right. So theory dictates that beta one should be around two. And we can ask if our data <coughs> shows contradiction to that, for instance. So we test this theory against, uh, for instance, an alternative two-sided here. Um, and this we cannot do to 100% in SPSS, so we have to do a little manual additional work, but it's based on the very same principles. So the test statistic is essentially the same, only now you have to take B1 minus uh, beta star here. So when beta star is zero, you get B1 minus zero, so you're back to the standard test, but now it can be something different. Right? And the idea is the same. If this one is true, then now this is having this same t distribution. So let's stick to still the large sample case. We can think of it as a standard normal distribution for t. So it could be two-sided or it could be one-sided alternative. But the test statistic will always be this. So clearly, for a two-sided test, even though this is a new situation for you, you know what to do, I hope. If I tell you that this is the, the test observator and the, or the test statistic, and I say we can use standard normal distribution, you just compute t observed by this formula. And then you compute the probability of being more critical than that, given h0 true. So that's the p-value. So for such an observation, it would be a small p-value pointing to rejection of h0. So let's do a, an example. You remember this uh, distance and duration data just Suppose in their, the transportation company, they may have a model saying that the slope of this relation is 2. But maybe our data, or we are suspecting that this is not correct, so we want to test maybe the beta 1 should rather be bigger. So the null hypothesis says that the model is correct, while if we reject it in favor of this, we are suggesting that we need to change the model. So this is a test for the slope coefficient in our regression. So let's see how we do it. And then we can do a little bit by hand, because we know that t equals the estimate minus the claimed value, which was 2, divided by the standard deviation of the estimate. And we just need the observed value of this thing. So where do we find this? Well, now you ask SPSS to kindly compute the coefficient b0 or b1 here and the standard deviation. And this is what we need. So 
B1 from the SPSS output is 2.23 approximately, and SB1 is 0 0.054. So you take this difference, divide here, and you get something like 4.90. So it's almost, I mean, it's very, uh, I was very lucky to draw this picture in advance because this looks very much like something that would be like 4.19 relative to a standard normal distribution. Agree? Because you would have, okay, you would have two somewhere here then approximately. And since the sample size in this case was 200, we are very safe using the standard normal instead of the T distribution. So we say, what's the probability of being outside of this or on the other side? Less than minus T ops, minus 4.19. Well, it's practically zero. And just to review this fundamental thing, we have a significance level, <laughs> typically 0 0.05. And if the p-value is below that, we typically, or we, not typically, we always reject <coughs> H0. So, in fact, these data then don't just tell us that the with the one different from zero, which is the standard test, but it also tells us that the one is greater than two. And now I see actually a little flaw here, because this is a one-sided test. So I should not compute using this one. But it's zero anyway, so the conclusion is the same. So the critical direction is now only on this side because it's a one-sided alternative. And this also makes sense because we know from this data that the confidence interval for the slope coefficient is already somewhere from 2.12 to 2.33 something. So the lower case is something like this. The higher case might be something like this, but even the lower possible estimate here is above two. Right. So this might seem fairly abstract at the moment. Why do we want to test these beta things? But it's actually very important in science, these kinds of tests. Because this beta one here, it tells us exactly the impact of distance on duration in this particular relation. And in general, it tells us something about the, the strength uh, and the magnitude of the effect of some variables on other ones. And that is uh, very much what science is about. Much of science is about that. So this, these kinds of, uh, of uh, tests are really important. OK, so this is a little bit new, but the general test for coefficient. OK. So we are still in a kind of review mode, but we just chew up again a little bit what we did last week. Um, so you remember we talked about something uh, called splitting the variation in, in the y variable, SST, it's total. This 
sums are actually related to the data. So you have a data set, and then you can measure exactly how much variation is there in the y data. And then you can buy some very nice uh, formulas. You can split it into two different sources. Um, yeah. Which was the SSR, which was the square sum or the variance from regression from X dependency. And this was from randomness. Right. I don't know why this projector is doing this. It th does not do it in any other course. So maybe it's my PDF slides that it doesn't like or something. It's still happening. While this is considering to turn on again, we go on manually. We dis define this important number called the R square as this. Um, and this is often called the Planetary power. So it says it's a measure of how much of this total variation can we explain by the model by x dependency. And basically, at least for forecasting models, we want r square close to 1. So it's the ratio or the fraction of, of total variation that we can explain by x dependency. And it can be at most 1, of course. If all variation is explained by x dependency, then we are at 1. Then we have a deterministic relationship. Okay, and then following also in this uh, uh, splitting of variation line, we got for free almost the estimate for the sigma e. So just remember that this. Um, Some data here. This is my best linear model, best linear estimate. Um, for each xi, this is the difference between the model prediction and the actual observation. And these differences, they are called ei. And if you take the sum of i square, we get exactly what I call S S E. So it's the sum of squares from error, as we say. Yep. And since this E random variable in the model is the error term. describing the randomness, it's natural that this measure here over the whole data set should give us some kind of estimate for, for sigma e. 
and it does in this formula here. So we can compute that using preferably some software. So here is more SPSS output. You see the R square, the SE sits here. It's all explained in Katya's nice PDF description. The total square sum, the SSE and the SSR sums are here. And you can just check that if you take that one and add to this one, you get this one. Uh, yeah. These numbers out here are not that important to us. We're not going to use them in this course, really. But they are, well, it all hangs together in a way. OK. OK. and. Going back once again also to discuss uh, using this model for forecasting. We're doing now maybe a little bit more slowly, something that we did quickly last week. Um, so if you remember the theoretical model, it states that you have this line and if you take an x value, you will get a y value that is beta 0 plus beta 1 times this x value. But you have to live with some deviation from that. Okay. So if I take my x value here, I'm not going to observe this. But I might observe that, or this, or this, or this. And I'm really interested in how large will these deviations typically be. So that's my forecast precision in a way that's on the stake. Here. And of course, it has all to do with the standard deviation of this guy. So one fundamental assumption was that this error term was normal would have mean 0. So we are equally likely to be on the upside as on the downside. And it has a fixed standard deviation. So the error terms should follow some kind of normal distribution. And then we know that we can then compute for any possible alpha. We can compute margins that leave a probability 1 minus alpha inside here, right? And we know that this will be this will be set alpha half times the standard deviation. Now, the problem with this, the main problem is that we don't really know this guy. It's a theoretical parameter, but we know how to estimate it using the formula on the previous slide involving this one. So we can't really find this error margin here, the theoretical margin, but we can find the estimated margin. So we replace with the estimate SE. And we do that fairly comfortably if sample sizes are not too small, again. So we look at error margins like plus minus set alpha half times SE. And yeah, what can I take away? We can take away this. So when we give a particular x value, 
I have my estimated line to give me my Y star forecast. That is just inserting X star into this equation. But the real probability sits somewhere here with probability 1 minus alpha. <coughs> so if alpha is 0 0.05, 1 minus alpha is 0 0.95, for instance. And I would have error margins. Or I will have a forecast interval that would be y star plus minus set alpha half times SC. And in this particular alpha case, this would be 1.96. And that is why we say, as a sort of heuristic or short, quick rule, if we want 95% forecast margins in regression analysis, you just say that this is close to 2. And you take 2 times this SC thing for 95%. Right. And again, of course, this is um, some approximation. So if you end up with smaller data set and you need the exact answer, you can read a little bit more of the theory about this. But the basic principle is like this. So considering this particular example where we had, <coughs> this was the distance of trips, and this was the duration of the same trips. We had n equal to 200, so it's a large sample. Um, and if we want a 90% margin of error instead of a 95, we would take this set factor, which is uh, not 0, it's 1.64 approximately. So your margin of error at 90% would be 1.64 times SE, which is 2.22. So if you're ha happy with just 90% forecast accuracy, you can live with this margin of error. If you want to go be a bit more certain, you have to accept this a higher margin of error, right? So you've got to go to 4.44. But this is the way it, it happens. And this is the crucial importance of this SE estimate that you find. Okay, so maybe, yeah, we'll do this before break. Um, and this is going to be done directly using SPSS, I hope. And it's just a descriptive thing. I want to show you just how you, how you draw this line in the SPSS in the data. Okay. So the data here are the flat prices depending on area, number of rooms, the standard of the flat, the situation, the location of the house and so on. But let's just look at something simple. Uh, graphs. So I'm just going to make the scatter plot. Simple. I'm going to put um, the area there and the price there and go OK. So you get this, and then you just, um, I want to add the regression line here to this plot. So I think you just you double click to open this chart editor. And I select all the points here. It's difficult to see, but there are some yellow. 
frame surrounding there and then you go to the elements here and fit line at total fit line means you fit a line to the data um, oh dear maybe I can take the screen <laughs> um, Take the break, <laughs> 15 minutes, then uh, let's see.